It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 288 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 4th of March 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr Shane Joseph. Hello. And Penny Dumsday. Hello. And today we'll be talking about life in a Mars-like desert, the history of gambling, quiet crickets and an unusual tardigrade. But before that, of course, don't forget you can help us make this show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. It uh, helps us keep it running and we really appreciate all the help we get from listeners who contribute. So let's begin, Shane, in April 2015, when an unusually heavy thunderstorm brought torrential rainfall to northern Chile's Atacama Desert, flooding one of the driest regions in the world. The, the second driest region, actually, after Dry Valley in Antarctica. There are weather stations in the Atacama that have never recorded rain. So this storm and the flooding that it brought was very unusual. But what does it tell us about microbial life in such extremely dry conditions? Mm, yeah, this is a very interesting story. Um, there's ob obviously the relationship to extreme environments such as Mars, which I think I think this this study was funded by um, yeah the European Research Council to study habitability on Mars because there's a nice sort of um it's a, it's an analogous to life on Mars and that there is pretty much no life in the Atacama Desert <laughs> as, that we can see in, in certain regions of it. It's very, very dry, as Ed said, um, to the point where it's, it is essentially a husk. Um, that being said, there has been microbial life detected in the soil of the Atacama Desert, especially in these arid regions. Um, and they contrast this with different life in the salt bedrock, which is, I think, a few, a, quite, a, quite, quite a few metres underground, whereby um, bacteria have been shown to absorb the water that's in the salt rocks. But what they're talking about here is essentially the topsoil, so about a foot underground, a foot down, which is very much affected by what is going on on the surface, such as the very, the very, very sparse rainfall that does occur every, you know, 100 years or whatever, and the heat and the, and the sun and the extremes of cold. Um so, yeah, this researcher, what they wanted to do was to look at life in the soil in a normal situation in the Atacama Desert, but then, of course, it rained, and quite a lot of rain, and it basically stuffed up their, their whole hypothesis. But what they thought was, okay, we'll look at life now, and then we'll look at life later. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, there was a, like a bloom of life after, the 2015, after those 2015 rainstorms. And you would kind of expect that um, if you have a few cells in the in the soil that are just basically you know waiting around for rain or something, they will take the opportunity to bloom. Now, and they did so dramatically. Now, in other parts of that desert, you get things like um, flower flowers popping up. Like you know, I, I think similar things happen in Australian deserts too. Yeah, it's common sort of footage on a lot of documentaries mm. of these flowers just you know time lapse accelerated just blooming yeah. everywhere and you get like a carpet of flowers yeah mm. yeah so it's very much a boom and a bust situation you know they'll, they'll make hay when the sun shines basically yeah so they looked at um life in the soil microbially they looked at um i think they tried to culture it they also looked at um dna sequencing of it which picks up live and dead cells so in some ways that's not particularly helpful but what they also did was look at um atp abundance and our atp is basically a little molecule that provides energy to and it's across all organisms that we know, um, ATP is basically a building, it's like a little energy factory in all our cells and everything from bacteria to elephants use it essentially. Um, and you can measure the rate of metabolism basically by looking at how much ATP is present. And yeah, they did find it, um, quite a lot of it. Then when they returned in two, I think two years later, like between 2016 and 2017, they found a lot less DNA and a lot less ATP in the soils. So it was a very temporary bloom, and obviously, and again, you would expect that. But the important thing is that it wasn't zero; they did still find it. 
so th they didn't just find the remnants of dead cells. They also found metabolizing cells in this really arid soil that, of which there is, you know, very little input of energy or water or otherwise. And this is something a bit close to my my past, I guess, because again, as a, as a few listeners will know, I did my my doctorate on soil bacteria and what can what grows there, what doesn't. And this is basically a more extreme version of that. Like this, what one of the questions we were looking at that was always in the back of our minds was, well, are these bacteria that we're detecting are they actually alive, or are we just detecting dead, you know, DNA from dead cells? And in this case, it sort of seems to suggest that well, these things are there because you are detecting in this very extreme soil anyway, you're detecting the energy building blocks of life at very, very low levels. Um, but they are there and they're basically, and, and there are estimates that in some of these, well, in, in things like permafrost soils, um, there's, there are estimates that cells replicate every thousand years to every 10,000 years. So very, very slow, like wow. almost considering that an E. coli cell in the right conditions will replicate every 20 minutes. You can, see, you can see the scale of, yeah, the, the, the difference here between them, between these cells and their lifestyles, essentially. And obviously, if you haven't got the energy to do it, you do it very, very slowly. Hmm. But you still do it. So life, you know, to, to, <laughs> to quote um, Ian Malcolm, life does find a way. <laughs> now, the question is, can you detect it? Um, if these cells are only reproducing every thousand years, let alone 10,000 years, how the hell you detect that like what are your limits of detection here you, you there's there probably isn't an accurate way to measure this so the question then extends to life on mars if something similar is happening in a place like mars which is you know a desert soil very much like the atacama which is also bombarded with radiation on a constant basis mm. if, if there even is life there will you ever be able to, to detect it if it's that slow growing it's a question it's a, it's a good question probably not without doing uh, soil samples and digging down, yeah, until you find it, sort of thing. Yeah, but uh, but I, I also have to wonder. I mean, there isn't quite the same boom and bust uh, rainfall cycle no. on Mars. You're talking about deposits of water, sort of frozen beneath the surface, that are maybe going to slowly melt over a thousand years, mm. perhaps. Yeah. So it's interesting. Well, if there is locked away, if there's locked away, um nutrient there in the form of water and, other, and otherwise there and if it is very very slow to supply the cells there it's possible that there will be growth there and that there will be viable respirating cells under the surface of places like mars but again if you can detect that without with our current level of technology i'm not really sure but it's an interesting little yeah. thought exercise anyway and I just love that there's this little testing ground that we've got on Earth that mimics Mars mm. so many ways, except when you've got your experiment all lined up mm -hmm. and suddenly it rains. <laughs> what the? <laughs> yeah, that, that must have been... I, I can only imagine the, 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 the swearing that must have occurred when they sat there yeah. and they've been great. Well, that's our, you know, that's our whole... Yeah. Um, this yeah. grant money is not no. going to last another three years. Pretty much. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, we have to reframe our entire our entire hypothesis. Great. But yeah. I think they did pretty well. Like, it was an interesting little um, follow up. And I think it does demonstrate it demonstrates like what happens in soils in periods of boom and then after the boom. You know, and in that Akama, I'm guessing it's even more extreme because while you have these very very occasional um, rainfalls. That are, you know, their effects don't last long because of the the nature of the place. You know, it doesn't matter how much rain falls in that short period, it's gonna all drain away into the bedrock anyway. So the topsoil will basically be parched again within, you know, very short period of time. So But I think it's also interesting that because it is such a heavy rainfall, I mean it's not like every few years you get a light drizzle. This is every few years it really pours. And I'm wondering if that's, you know, maybe if that's filtering down to those sort of lower levels where there might be other microbes that will then get some yeah. water off it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all very interesting. It might uh, be, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, well, Penny, two Dutch researchers have looked at more than 100 examples of dice, like gambling dice, from the last 2,000 years in the Netherlands. And this huge collection of dice can give us some clues about how people have thought about chance and fate and probability over the centuries, can't it? Yeah, I found this quite fascinating because I guess, you know, 
dice is something that you I don't really think about much. Mm. You just take it for granted <laughs> and everything about them, like their shape, the fact that they're evenly weighted, like I've, you know, I think we've all heard of weighted dice or, you know, cheating mm-hmm. dice. Even the way that the numbers are marked and placed, like the one opposite the six and so on. You, you um, never played Dungeons & Dragons, did you, Ben? I have never played Dungeons & Dragons. I'm aware of, like, different-sided dice. Different <laughs> I mean, numbers. I didn't really either, but, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's just – they're just a thing. And I think, for me, this real assumption is that they're mathematical, they're, it's all a probability thing, you know? Like, especially as a teacher, like, dice are almost this example of pure random prob- – do you know what I mean? But yeah, like I started reading this and I, I was starting to think, who came up with the idea of six sides and, you know, everything else add out, adds up to seven sort of thing? Like, why would you even just decide on that? And obviously, it's something that they've worked out mathematically. Uh, I think it, it talked about, uh, was it Galileo, who worked out that in a game with three dice, the number 10 would come up more often than the number nine. Which is something that you'd, you'd only pick up on that if you'd done thousands and thousands of rolls. But he was able yeah. to reason that why and show mathematically why it would happen. But or if you, I was going to say, if you're applying maths and logic and probability to mm-hmm. evenly weighted dice. But what I thought was interesting about this study is they looked at, as you said, dice from 2000 years ago. And the Roman era dice were quite different. They were often not actually cubes they were often like noticeably flatter than a true cube and so the way that they fell we would have thought is not fair so to speak but their idea and I don't know how you could possibly sort of get this from the archaeological record but it's an interesting one to think about is that for the Romans I mean this was something to do with divine intervention the divide the dice and they, the Romans were really into like omens and interpreting sort of omens and, you know, cutting open birds and looking at their liver and deciding if that meant they should go into battle or not. Like this was a thing which, you know, I'm sure it's like, oh, yes, the gods say we should go into battle just like <laughs> he wants to. But, you know, but if there was this belief that the dice were a way of gods communicating with you in whatever way, it doesn't matter if they're even or not. So Right. Okay, cuz so, yeah. it, it's not a matter of chance, it's a matter it's of, a matter of an external it's, force determining it. Yeah, an external force is is controlling whether you win or lose. It's does Venus want you to win or not? Well, if she does, it doesn't it doesn't matter. And I'm sure, you know, there were people who kind of figured things out and took advantage mm. of whatever. Mm. But um Apparently, after the Roman period, dice kind of disappeared in from the record, at least in the Netherlands, and then they come back in the Middle Ages, and the numbers are arranged in a different way. And again, here's an assumption I never thought about: instead of that arrangement of sevens, where you've got you know one and six, two and five, everything adds up to seven, mm-hmm. uh, they had one called primes. So one and two are opposite each other, three and four are opposite each other, five and six are opposite each other. Um, and I guess also when you think about the Middle Ages, I mean, it's not known as one of the most sort of pro-science, pro-rationality periods, <laughs> but by the seven, by the 17th century, Galileo, yeah, as Ed said, is writing about probability and why if you're playing a game with three dice, you should get the number 10 more than the number nine. And I mean, that reminds me of equations that I would have done in, you know, senior school maths like back in the day of you know calculating probability of dice rolls and dice are going back to this sevens configuration back to kind of balance them and so um this idea that they need to be balanced kind of conceptually as well as physically they become much more standard except for cheating dice and i just thought this was fascinating it's um it's so embedded in the way we think that dice are a random number generator, essentially. Hmm. Hmm. But if you weren't told that they were fair, if someone said, you know what, Penny, totally crazy, it's actually the gods that control the dice. Like, like oh, yeah, fair enough, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, oh, yeah, it's if like everything else in my culture was working that way, then why not? 
So, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I thought it was interesting to find out that, you know, and you could say, oh, maybe dice weren't standard because manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. But I feel if people want something to be quite standard in the Roman mm-hmm. period, they could have made it. Yeah. So I just thought that was interesting, just the way that um, we can think, think, the way that we think about probability and randomness different differently, this, this awareness of randomness that, has grown that it's not like there's this sort of doom or destiny that the gods have laid out and we're like oh yeah it might rain tomorrow it might not we don't know it is going to be a random thing Mm. yep i also like that they uh, when we're talking about you know how do you determine what numbers to put on and how many sides to have they did an experiment with school children uh to number sides of paper cubes and not very few of them would do it in the pattern that we've talked about. It's not an intuitive thing to use yeah. sevens or primes. They'd write on one face, turn at 90 degrees, write on the next face. And so you just get around and that's the thing. It was a more ordered, I guess, in some ways approach, but mm. a less mathematical approach. So it, it's purely a, some thought has gone into the way we do dies now. Yeah. Um, okay, so the island of Kauai is geographically the oldest of the Hawaiian islands. And like a lot of places, there are crickets there that would normally be chirping away in the warm evenings. Except they don't chirp there, at least not anymore. They're there, but they're quiet. Penny, who or what silenced the crickets? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> 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 I was feeling a bit dramatic when I wrote that. <laughs> it's a parasitic fly has silenced these crickets. And of course. This is, of course, well, of course. The yeah. old parasitic the old fly. Parasitic. <laughs> <laughs> it was the fly on, on um, Kauai with the larvae. Um, <laughs> so the crickets, of course, chirp and in... Um, Marlene Zook, who's the researcher who did this study, has um, studied them in 1991. There they were, chirping away. In 2001, she heard one cricket and she didn't see many crickets either. A couple of years later, she goes back. They're they're there again. Uh, She can see them everywhere but cannot hear the crickets. And this is bizarre because for crickets, their chirp is an essential thing. The males are the ones that chirp and they chirp to attract a female. So no chirping, no attraction, no baby crickets, no more crickets. Mm. So what happened? Um, There's a parasitic fly that was very sensitive in hearing. It um, finds the males, it hears their calls, splatters splatters its larvae into them the larvae then, as parasites tend to do, um, burrow into the crickets and eat them. And when this fly was at its height, um, the crickets were really, really reduced in numbers. At least a third of the male crickets were wiped out. But when they bounced back, they bounced back with a mutation. And you might think, oh, good, you know, they needed to do something about this mm. fly, so they got this mutation. But it was just a mutation that if it had happened at any other time, would probably have been, well, would almost certainly have been a no-no. It was mm. the mutation that made them it would wipe them out. Violent. Yeah. It, um, the little files on their legs that, um, that they rub together to make, on their wings, I mean, to, um, to make their sound were at weird angles, which meant that when they did rub, they didn't make a sound. So usually that would be such a liability it wouldn't be passed on. But in this particular circumstance with this fly that is attracted to crickets by sound, being silent is a godsend for the cricket. So these males, this trait has spread. The males, the silent males are more and more common. They can't attract a female but they hang around next to a male who is singing because there are still a few of them left and hope that, any female that comes to mate with him might get a bit confused and mate with them instead. That's so Um, grim. (laughs) Yeah, it's so (laughs) grim. And the thing that I found quite, I don't know, touching 
in a weird way, because they, they are just crickets, is that they still try to sing. They still move their wings and try and get these movements. And that's a lot of effort, like biologically speaking. They, they're using a lot of energy to make these movements for no reason that we can ascertain. And probably I'm going to just put it out there and say I don't think crickets are ultra smart. Just because they've got a mutation that means they don't make a sound doesn't mean they've got the intelligence to go, oh, well, I'm not making a sound, so I won't well, bother they probably, doing that. They probably yeah. can't. I mean, they might, not, not, they might not even be able to detect that they're not making a sound. A yeah. And B, exactly. and B, as the article sort of points out, like it's a, it's sort of, it's hardwired into their genetic code yeah. to do this. Mm. Mm. So yeah, that's exactly. a, that, that's basically, you know, it's one that's been handed down from cricket to cricket for you know, mm. generations or whatever. So the point is that, yeah, even though they still, even though they're not making a noise, they're still going to be, reflexively doing this during mating season so mm -hmm. it's I, I actually find it oh, i find it kind of as i said grim very grim like mm -hmm. the idea of these soundless crickets screaming into the void but no one hears them <laughs> well, i know I, it's the same it's, like i found it quite moving um I just and it's interesting to, like, <laughs> what is going to happen with these crickets are the ladies going to pick up on something else to mm. find their mates mm. because i mean Will we see them developing colours or something or more distinctive appearance to attract them maybe? Maybe. And, I mean, this was a pretty quick kind of spread of a trait through a population. Like they were, yeah, yeah like. Less than 20 generations. Mm. That's mm. evolution at high speed. It is. <laughs> for yeah. something this complicated, I guess. Except this might, this might spell the death knell of the species, really. Um, yeah. If you can't get any breeders. Like I'm guessing these few crickets that can sing will most likely die out um, if, they, if the parasitic fly is still around infecting them. That being said, the, the fewer of them are, maybe, you know, yeah. a bit like herd immunity or whatever, you know, same sort of principle, they'll be, the, the fly won't be as abundant, maybe. And which means that these, these, these singing crickets might yet outcompete their non-singing counterparts again. Mm -hmm. So I guess the population could sort of be raised up to the levels of, you know, the original singers, if you want to call them that. It's yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like as the article also says, we probably won't see the outcome of this because even though this was yeah. a very very quick evolution, um, the eventual outcome might be a bit slower, and we probably won't see what happens to this species. But yeah, it's I'd like to think that um, some scientist somewhere in the future will be like, I'm so glad they took records of that in the mm. early mm. 21st century. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we're not just wondering. Yeah. We've got the genome sequence yeah. before the mutation, after the mutation. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's some, some record there at least. Uh, okay, Shane, we've talked about tardigrades before on the show. These microscopic organisms that kind of look like weird eight-legged bears. They're among the most resilient creatures we know of. They can survive the vacuum of space, extreme heat above 150 degrees Celsius, extreme cold below minus 200 degrees they can survive for weeks without water. They're nearly indestructible. Mm. And now researchers in Japan have discovered a new species, the 168th species of tardigrade to be discovered. Where was it found and what makes it not like other tardigrades? So, yeah, this, this, this researcher basically goes and studies moss in his hometown. And I think it just found it was found from a moss. Like, and a lot of these tardigrades are found in very, very mundane places which kind of makes them even more fascinating the fact that these very very hardy not just very hardy stupidly hardy little creatures are found in some of the most normal places on the face of the earth <laughs> they're not found in extreme you know they're not really found in extreme environments or at least if they are that's not where they mostly reside where you would expect them to reside hmm. but yeah which is interesting in and of itself because why would they have not evolved to not need those requirements well, sort of thing, you know? It, they might, haven't it, lost it might be those. that their local environment in like a moss or a lichen might be subject to very extreme conditions of drying and wetting. So it's possible that, you know, in some ways they are perfectly suited for this environment. We just, just on a micro level, we don't really see it. You know, like tide pools, for example, are quite extreme because they are subject to the heat of the day plus constant water coming in at you know when the tides come in so that's an extreme environment in a way but we don't think of it that way 
if you Fair know enough. so i think mosses might be the same I, I don't really know enough about it to be honest um but anyway this new species which is called i will find the name macrobiotus shonaicus yep nailed it um i'm not sure i'm not sure what it's named after but the point is that that's the new one um yeah so it's it, it feeds on algae um which you know is i think in this in this genus that's that's pretty common. What makes this little bug special is its eggs, apparently. Um, they look kind of... <laughs> I was looking at this and I was kind of thinking alien. <laughs> I really was. You know, you know, see where they go into the egg... In, in, into the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what I yes, mean? Yes, all the eggs. Yeah, yes. it kind of reminded me of that, even though they don't really look like that. But just the arrangement <laughs> and the kind of spooky... Anyway, yeah, they, they've got these little noodle-like um, protrusions on them. Um, and apparently that might, that might help... The egg attached to a surface where you know where it's where, where, it, where it gets dropped, um, yeah. So and apparently it's um this new species is part of a group that apparently has these decorations on them, but apparently they've never been found in a in a, in Asia before. So it just shows okay. sort of how ubiquitous these organisms are, how diverse they are, and how how widespread they are. So yeah, just a little side note that I, I just thought was kind of cool. Um, it yeah. is kind of cool. Yeah. I, li- I like, and I'm not sure like is the right word because it's kind of gruesome looking, these three rows of teeth they've got in their mouths, these circular mouths with three mm. rows of vicious teeth. Yeah, they're, <laughs> But, they're, of course, they're min- minute, so not yeah, a I mean, threat. You know, but not, not if you believe the new horrible Star Trek, which... Oh, you're not <laughs> going there, are you? I am going there. I Star Trek like Discovery... That. You mean you don't like it? Star Trek Discovery, I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen um, it then? I have not watched it. Don't but I, I thought it was meant to be not bad. It was, or is it that sucked. just completely wrong? It's, it's awful. Look, I only got four I only got four episodes in and that was enough <laughs> for me. I thought, no, I'm not subjecting myself and my love of Trek to this any further. This can get There's sp- a fair bit of soap opera to it and then a stupid spore <sighs> drive which is faster than warp and somehow they've linked that to a giant tardigrade yes but, spoiler alert um, <laughs> they scrap this massive tardigrade which is, and i say massive i mean this tardigrade is the size of an elephant the size of a large dog and they strap it into a chair and torture it to make the spore drive work so not only is it ludicrous it goes against everything that star trek sort of stands for in terms of you know not not harming things <laughs> and don't forget about the prime directive what prime directive um uh, i don't know is well this it, is before prime directive is this it? is before no, kirk not. and all that oh wait is the prime directive oh you're right it is too yeah okay um but one Still. thing you're going to find funny uh shane is you know how i hate alternative universe storylines when they're like going it. to there's a mirror universe or whatever yeah. and, and i know you like it in ds9 yeah uh, i i hate it generally in Discovery, they go into a mirror universe and things actually pick up when that happens. But see, the whole thing is a mirror not. universe to me. The whole thing <laughs> is one because there's no way this That's could survive. That's probably like why it improves. If, 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 you, if this goes, oh, God. Uh, yeah, this is turned into, you know, Star Trek. Yeah, we've, we've strayed off the uh, um, topic of science. No, honest, uh, you know, it, 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 if, you, if this is somehow going to fit into the Star Trek canon, how does this spore drive figure into it? Like, what happens to it? Yeah. It never gets mentioned again, as far as I'm aware. So, what the hell? Like, are they just going to be assume that this is like a, a now standalone universe that it goes its own merry little way with them merrily going through space on the backs of spores in space? Which don't even get me started on that ludicrousness. Anyway, all right. Sorry. Write in. Give us your thoughts on the new Star Trek. <laughs> write to Shane at scienceontop.com. So you, you, everyone will say I'm wrong. They'll say I'm bloody, uh, <laughs> but no, but it sucks, and I don't care what you think. <laughs> Uh, you're a people person, Shane. And on that colourful note, uh, I think that's our show. As always, the links we talked about are in the show notes, or you can go to scienceontop.com slash 288. Uh, please leave us some feedback there or on social media. And if you like, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. Thank you for joining me today, Shane and Penny. No worries, mate. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Well, 
if you're lacking in the hair department, you won't have to pay much for this Super. potential oh. cure for baldness. Like Thank you. <laughs> Japanese scientists say eating McDonald's could help hair to regrow what? after seeing some promising results in lab tests. Apparently, a chemical used in Macca's fries they is behind this fries. hair-brained idea, Ugh. although it may well be a bald-faced oh. lie. We went looking for mentions of medicinal Maccas in that Japanese study and found not one. So then we contacted lead author Professor Junji Fukuda to ask if he had claimed that eating fries could cure baldness. And he told me to watch. No, never.